Stephen Cornell. Okay, so that you uh, understand who's speaking, this is Stephen Buckley, Legal Services Counsel. And this is Cordell Johnston, not Stephen Buckley. <laughs> so the purpose of this webinar is to cover non-public sessions uh, under the right to know law uh, as an exception to the public meeting requirement. And so these are the things we'll cover today. Um, first, we'll cover meetings that can be held without the public being present, which are not subject to the right to know law. Uh, what are permissible reasons for entering non-public session? How to enter and exit non-public session, session uh, when you're in a public meeting? Uh, keeping of minutes for non-public sessions? Uh, the sealing of non-public meeting minutes and the duration that they have to be kept sealed? And then we'll talk generally about the penalties for non-compliance with the right to know law. So, in general, when is a meeting subject to RSA 91A? Well, the statute defines meeting, and it's here on the screen, anytime a quorum of the public body meets. And that meeting can also include a meeting in person or by telephone and electronic communication, uh, where all the members can contemporaneously communicate with each other. And it's any time when any such meeting occurs for the purpose of discussing or acting upon a matter which the public body has supervision, control, or jurisdiction. Now there are a lot of meetings that take place, a number of them specified in the statute, which are not, quote, meetings, close quote, subject to the right to know law. So we'll spend some time covering those and discuss some of them in detail. So first, a chance encounter where people are not acting upon public matters and where no decisions are made is not a public meeting. So if the selectmen or two selectmen and a select board of three run into each other at a local diner and have breakfast and they're not discussing public matters, it's not a meeting subject to the requirements of the right to know law. Second, strategy or negotiations with respect to collective bargaining are completely outside the purview of the right to know law. So that would include uh, any meeting that takes place to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement, um, would certainly include discussions that management has on that subject, and uh, certainly meetings that would take place between a bargaining unit and the management team. Consultation with legal counsel. In general, legal counsel and the right to have legal counsel consultations confidential is also protected by the right to know law. And we'll discuss some important elements of the consultation with legal counsel that you should be aware of. And just to be clear, uh, we're talking here about um, what we call non-meetings. We're, uh, we're not getting yet into the non-public session discussion, which is uh, understand that a non-public session is different from something that is not a meeting. And there is a, uh, there is a basis for going into non-public session to discuss certain legal matters. That's something that Steve will talk about later. Uh, but right now we're talking about a non-meeting, uh, a consultation with legal counsel. And if, if, if it's not a meeting, it is, uh, as Steve said, simply not subject to RSA 91A. It's important that you keep in mind the difference between those two concepts, a, a non-meeting and a non-public session. Yeah, Cordell, I think that's a very good point, and it's one of the one of the point out here, because we, there's two broad areas uh, where the public can be excluded from the meetings of public officials. There's this area where the right to know law doesn't apply, which we're discussing right now, and then there's this whole other area of specific reasons why a public body can go into non-public session to discuss specific topics. Um, so continuing on the list of those matters which are events which are not considered meetings and subject to the right to know law would be a caucus of an elected member of a public body of the same political party. So when the Republican or Democratic caucus meets in the House of Representatives, that's not a meeting subject to the right to know law. And finally, this is a relatively new one, circulation of draft documents that will formalize decisions previously made in a meeting. And again, uh, we'll, I'm going to talk about that one in more detail a little bit in a few minutes. So uh, it's important 
when dealing with this non-meeting under the right to know law consultation with legal counsel, what is necessary in order to have a legal consultation with legal counsel that's not subject to the right to know law. And as seen on the screen here, there's been a recent decision of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, Ettinger versus Town of Madison, that directly addressed that issue. Uh, and I, if I recollect the circumstances of that uh, decision, uh, basically what happened, you had a public body that decided to meet and discuss in non-public session a uh, legal memorandum that the public body had received from legal counsel. And then after having that discussion, they eventually came out of non-public session where they had that discussion and they decided, elected to make a decision. And so uh, the question was whether that was a legal meeting uh, for the public body to have just to simply discuss, uh, discuss a legal memorandum that had been received from legal counsel. And the Supreme Court took great pains to point out that a consultation requires the ability to have a contemporaneous exchange of words and ideas between the public body and the attorney. So if legal counsel sends you a memorandum, you can't go into non-public session to discuss the memorandum and, and claim that you're, uh, it's not a meeting because it's legal consultation and it's confidential communication. If you want to have a consultation with legal counsel, legal counsel has to be in the room with you. Now, uh, I think Cordell would, uh, would probably agree with me that it's quite possible, because there's language in the Ettinger case, that um, that consultation could take place in a contemporaneous manner if it was by telephone conference. But that has not yet been reached by the Supreme Court. The only thing we know from the Supreme Court decision in Ettinger is the consultation has to be contemporaneous and the safest route, if you want to be absolutely safe, is make sure legal counsel is in the room with you, and that meeting would not be subject to the right to know law. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and it's certainly the safer thing to do is, is to have the legal counsel physically present. It, it makes sense to me that, that you should be able to have a consultation with legal counsel if, 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 the, if your legal counsel is on the phone, um, but as, as uh, Steve indicates, that hasn't that question hasn't been answered. It wasn't raised in the Ettinger case, so uh, we can't say for sure that that would qualify. If if one of your boards wants to uh, be the test case, uh, <laughs> feel free to do that. But uh, but until someone does that, the safer thing is to have your legal counsel physically present in the room. And unfortunately, that may mean paying that person to travel to your, to, to your meeting and back. Uh, but again, that is the safer route. Um, the next uh, uh, item where a meeting is not subject to the right to know law is the circulation of draft documents that will formalize decisions previously made in a meeting. Um, and I, actually, I recently witnessed um, this actually being implemented by a public body. I was at a school board meeting, and I think that the school board member who was uh, the chair of the meeting was actually carefully counseled how to use this particular provision. So what the school board did at that meeting is they made a decision uh, to write a letter to respond to a communication that the school board had gotten from a third party. Uh, and so the school board members all decided, okay, we want the letter to say X, Y, and Z. And then the school board voted, we hereby agree to respond to this third party's letter by saying the following things, and we hereby delegate to the chairman of the school board to write the letter for us. Uh, and then the school board, and that motion was adopted, and then the school board chairman said, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to write the letter and then I'm going to circulate it to you by email. And if you have any comments on the email, uh, the draft that I send to you, please send them to me. Um, but we're not, we're not going to change the content that I've been authorized to write. I'm just going to ask you to make sure I've captured the concepts correctly, maybe make editorial or uh, spelling change corrections. And, and so the intent was to have an email 
a serial ear email communication amongst all, all the board members, which would ordinarily uh, violate the right to know law by having a meeting through a serially exchanged <laughs> electronic communication. But in this instance, I think under this provision where it's not a meeting, so long as there were no changes made to the content of what was intended to be communicated, it would be permissible for the, the chairman to circulate the draft letter, make no substantive changes, and allow him to receive comments, um, and that would be permissible and, again, not subject to the right to know law. So we'll now take a poll, and I think we'll let Cordell handle that. Yeah, uh, well, it's pretty self-explanatory, but this is a question to test your knowledge of the right to know law. Um, is, is consideration of a request for a tax abatement a proper reason for a non-public session? And your options are yes, no, or maybe. So please uh, enter your answers, and we'll give you a few, a few seconds. Okay, it looks like uh, most people have voted. The uh, majority said the answer is no. Actually, the, <laughs> the, the correct answer here is maybe, um, because uh, there are two provisions of uh, RSA 91A3 that apply here, um, and Steve will talk about the basis for non-public sessions in a minute, but one of, one of the basis for non-public sessions is um, consideration uh, of pending claims or litigation, and that provision says an application for a tax abatement shall not constitute threatened or filed litigation. So that would suggest that the answer is no. However, there's another provision. <clears throat> um, you can go into non-public session to discuss matters that would adversely affect the reputation of any person other than a member of the public body. And that provision says this exemption shall extend to an application for assistance or tax abatement if based on inability to pay or poverty of the applicant. So uh, the answer here is uh, it depends on the circumstances. If, if it's a request for a tax abatement based on inability to pay or poverty, then yes, that is a proper reason for a non-public session. Okay, so we'll move on to the next uh, segment which deals with non-public sessions which are permissible under RSA 91-A colon 3. Um, in order to hold a non-public session, you have to give notice of a meeting where the non-public session is going to be held, whether that's part of a general agenda with a notice as required under the statute, or whether that's just a separate meeting where you're just going to have a non-public meeting uh, content. You have to still post notice of any such meeting. The other thing I think is important is uh, there's a provision in the statute which I think everyone should be aware of. And it says, if the town or the city has guidelines or rules or the charter of that town or city require broader public access for either official meetings and records, then the charter provision or guidelines or rules of order shall take precedence over the requirements of 91A. Um, I, Cordell and I discussed this uh, the other day, and I think it'd be reasonable to, to point out that this is sort of like a local option where towns can broaden the amount of public access that can be allowed to either meetings or public records. But the other thing I think important to keep in mind, if you have rules of procedure, they could be rules of procedure that govern the uh, the bylaws that govern the uh, operation of the Board of Selectmen or the ZBA or Planning Board, and they touch and concern issues such as public access to records or meetings, and those provisions are broader in scope in terms of the rights of the public to participate or have knowledge about public proceedings, I believe that this particular provision in 91A3 will, in effect, uh, broaden the amount of rights the public has to public access. So something to keep in mind when you're drawing up bylaws for a board or a commission and or 
if you're drafting a charter for a city or town. So ju just to um, give an example of what that might be, um, as, as Steve mentioned, notice of the time and place of any meeting, whether it's uh, a public session or non-public session, has to be posted in two places. Uh, and, it all, and it has to be posted at least 24 hours in advance. You might have uh, rules of procedure. This, the Board of Selectmen might have adopted rules of procedure that say uh, that notice of our meetings must be posted 48 hours or 72 hours in advance. I don't, I don't know that many boards have that, but it's possible that you would. And if you have adopted a, a rule like that, uh, this, pro <clears throat> this provision, I, I think, uh, it could be read that that uh, is, is, takes precedence over the right, right to know law, and that stricter rule that you have in your rules of procedure could be enforced um, just as uh, as the right to know law can be enforced. So you need to so you need to comply uh, with the stricter rules that you've adopted if if you have something like that. And the provision that that uh, Steve mentions. Uh, here is if you're looking for it's in RSA 91A colon 2 Roman numeral 2. It's a long paragraph and it's right at the end of that long paragraph. So how do you go into non-public session to RSA 91A3? Uh, first you have to have a motion to go into non-public session and the motion has to state on its face the specific exemption which is going to be relied upon. The vote to go into non-public session it has to be by roll call vote. And you have to have an affirmative vote of the majority of the members present. And I, let me just interject somewhat rudely here. Uh, um, interestingly, I think this is the only place anywhere in any statute that it refers to a motion made and seconded. So you, uh, although um, as, a, as a general matter, there is no legal requirement that motions be seconded. I mean, I think most boards do it as a matter of course, but technically there's no legal requirement. And with a three-person board of selectmen, it doesn't really seem necessary. But uh, 91A3 specifically says that a motion to go into non-public session must be duly made and seconded. And then all the discussions held, the decisions made during the non-public session have to be confined to the matters set out in the motion. And that's important because uh, things can happen in a meeting where people suddenly begin to have a discussion potentially that is not germane to the reason why you went to the non-public session. Uh, and so the public body members have to be disciplined in their discussion and ensure that they're keeping their discussion consistent with the reasons why they're non-public. It's important and it requires, again, discipline on the part of the public body and maybe a reminder from perhaps staff who are assisting and taking minutes or notes. So let's talk about uh, specific reasons to go into non-public session. The one um, often employed, as I have seen in my practice in municipal law, uh, 91A3, Roman 2, subparagraph A, Dismissal, promotion, or compensation of any public employee or the discipline of such employee. So, again, that's dismissal, promotion, compensation, or discipline of a public employee. And then it goes on to say, unless the public employee has a right to a meeting and requests the meeting be open. Um, now, that originates from a case from 1994. I think it was uh, Nash versus the town of can't remember off the top of my head. But, I don't remember either. Yeah, in any case. So what what I think the important point about this has a right to a meeting and request the meeting to be open. That is not based upon the right to know law. That's based upon local rules that you might have. It could be a personnel rule. It could be a charter requirement. It could be a local ordinance. But if there is something in your personnel rules, for instance, that say a public employee who is the subject of a disciplinary hearing has a right to uh, request a meeting with the Board of Selectmen before discipline is finalized, or if, for instance, let's say in your personnel rules, uh, the administration has the power to uh, uh, impose a disciplinary action against an employee, but then the personnel rules provide that the employee can appeal that decision by the administrator to the Board of Selectmen, 
those would be examples of a local rule that would have the employee given the right to have a meeting. And in those instances, the employee could say, I want to have this meeting, uh, and I could uh, request the meeting be held in open session. Um, now, one of the things that we've discussed uh, uh, this week in preparation for this webinar is um, under what circumstances would it be necessary for the public body to give notice to the affected employee that they're about to have a meeting that concerns their compensation, discipline, or other related matters that would be permissible to go into non-public session concerning a public employee. Um, and our, our view would be this, if the, if the public body knows that your local rules do provide for the uh, employee being, having the right to be, uh, have a public, have a meeting with the Board of Selectmen, as an example, concerning a proposed disciplinary action, and you know that to be true, that your local rules provide for that, I think in that instance, it would be necessary that you give foreknowledge or notice to the affected employee or about to have a meeting on your discipline uh, so they could uh, exercise their right, perhaps, to ask that the meeting be open. Um, and um, just to clarify something here, um, I've frequently heard boards talk about going into non-public session to talk about personnel. Uh, please don't ever use that description. There's, if you look in 91A3, there's nothing. The word personnel, I'm pretty sure, doesn't appear in there anywhere. You need to be much more precise. Uh, the, the statute requires that you state the specific ground, the specific basis for going into non-public session. And if you're under paragraph 2A, it's the dismissal, promotion, or compensation of a public employee or disciplining of such employee. Um, I've, I've heard um, boards talk about uh, going into non-public session to discuss personnel when the personnel they were discussing was a, a member of their own board. That's not, that's not permissible. Um, and that's why it's important to, to focus on the precise language if you, if you focus on uh, the reference to public employees, you'll know that discussing a member of the board is not a basis for going into non-public session. Or, for example, discussing an appointment to fill a vacancy on the planning board or, a Z, or the ZBA, that's not a public employee, that's, uh, that's a public official. Uh, and then next, as indicated on the slide, 91A3 Roman 2B permits the uh, public body to go to non-public session when you're discussing the hiring of any person as a public employee. And again, that would be a corollary to what, uh, as a corollary to what Cordell just said, that would not include, uh, if you phrase the term hiring, the assignment of a new person to the planning board, uh, that would not fall into this category. It has to be a person who's going to be hired as an employee uh, and under that basis, you could go into non-public session and have that discussion. When I was uh, when I was a um, a selectman, one one of the hardest issues we had to deal with was we we were a five-person board, and uh, one of the members resigned. So now we were a four-person board, and we needed to fill the vacancy. There were two people who were interested in filling the vacancy, and predictably, two of us on the board favored one candidate and two favored the other candidate. So the question arose, well, of course we should, we should uh, meet in private to discuss this, right? Well, the answer is no, we, we can't do that. Uh, that's not a basis for a non-public session. So we had to have that painful discussion, and I'll tell you it was painful. We had, we had to have that discussion in public. It's not pleasant, but that's what the, that's what the law requires. Um, now, the next uh, item under going to non-public session we'll discuss is adverse impact reputation. Uh, 91A3, Roman 2C, uh, is the reputation provision of the steps that allows to go to non-public session uh, when the discussion would adversely affect uh, the reputation of any person except for a member of the public body itself. Uh, and then the provision goes on to say, this exemption shall extend, this is probably one of the few 
very per se rules that we have in the, uh, the right to know law, the exemption extends to any application for assistance or a tax abatement or a waiver of a fine or a fee or other levy if it's based upon inability to pay or poverty of the applicant. Um, so uh, if someone has filed a tax abatement uh, because of inability to pay their taxes due to um, their finances being so poor or they're unable to meet their current expenses, uh, then that would be a legitimate basis to go into non-public session under reputation. Um, now, what I, what I tried to do was a little research on, on what is the kind of thing that would be a reputation, something that would impair someone's reputation, and I came up with a case that involved uh, former Governor Thompson. And the standard, and this is a defamation standard, just, which is just a uh, legal term used in, in the legal field where if someone's reputation is harmed, you can, uh, there's a legal claim called defamation, also known as libel and slander, uh, libel being written, slander being by word, which can be employed to recover damages for an injury to reputation. And the standard in that case was, is the content of the proposed discussion likely to lower a person in the esteem of any substantial and respectable group, even though it may be quite a small minority? Um, the other standard that I recall from my uh, days of uh, being in law school, you could have a reputation impairment um, when you had someone whose uh, character uh, as a business person or their business was going to be impaired uh, due to uh, allegations of not running a, uh, a business in a fair and open manner uh, or being a uh, sharp practices type business person, that would go to a, a per se standard for impairing someone's reputation in terms of their ability to run a business. There could be many other examples, but um, I, I think the only one that I felt was comfortable was this uh, we lower someone's estimation uh, or esteem in, of a substantial respectable group, even though it may be a quite small minority. I, I think the um, you need to be careful about overusing the reputation um, uh, basis for non-public session. Again, I, I've heard people use that when basically they want, wanted to talk about something in private, and they said, "Well, yeah, might 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 adversely affect someone's reputation." Um, you, I, I would uh, look at what. Uh, Steve just mentioned as essentially a defamation standard. If you if if what you're uh, going to talk about is someone has been uh, accused of a crime or some kind of you know sexual impropriety, stealing money from the town, obviously that kind of discussion could adversely affect the person's reputation. But if you're just if you're going into non-public session because you want to. Uh, you want to criticize someone because you don't like them, that, that doesn't cut it. Uh, again, going back to um, the situation where you're considering someone to fill a vacancy on the board of selectmen, uh, I could easily imagine, and I think this happened, someone saying we should dis discuss this in non-public session because the discussion could adversely affect the person's reputation. And you go into non-public session and someone says, yeah, I don't like him because he's a loud mouth. Uh, or you know he's uh, he smells bad or whatever. Those are those are those are just opinions. Those are not really uh, verging on defamation, which is I which I think is uh, what really justifies this uh, this criterion. So think carefully about about this before you before you try to use it to uh, apply to anything where you're going to be talking about somebody. Although I will give one example that I think actually did fit neatly into the, the argument that the impairment of reputation could harm someone's business practices. I did represent a town where um, there was a building inspector who more or less had formed an opinion that a particular contractor uh, was doing shoddy work in the town uh, and he began to tell people in town, whoever would ask him, that builder so-and-so was a very shoddy builder, did very poor work. Now, at some point, the selectman became aware that the building inspector was sharing these opinions with citizens who were working for building permits, and they were very concerned about that 
communication taking place between the building inspector and people getting building permits. So they said, let's have a, a discussion about this at a, a Board of Selectmen's meeting. And I think they correctly realized we better have this in non-public session because if we allow the building inspector to explain why he's saying this, this is going to harm the reputation of the small contractor, which may or may not be a legitimate um, allegation. And I think that would have been a legitimate reason to go in the non-public session because it would have directly harmed this person's uh, business reputation. And I think that would have been a fair basis. And it was a fair basis to go in the non-public session. We're now, uh, we're now to our second poll question. Uh, after, so let's assume you've been in a non-public session. And after that, at the end of that non-public session, it's a five-person board of selectmen that you're a member of. There is a motion to seal the minutes. And uh, on that motion to seal the minutes, three members vote yes, one member votes no, and one member abstains from voting. Does that motion to seal the minutes pass? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer yes, no, or maybe. Well, most people have voted, and the overwhelming answer is yes. Um, I think actually, and Steve, Steve and I discussed this uh, earlier this week, and we concluded that, that the answer actually is maybe. Uh, not, not that it may be yes in some circumstances and, and no in others, but just that the answer is unclear. What the, and here's why. What the statute says, and, and probably most of you know this, is that a motion to seal the minutes um, passes if by a re it passes by a recorded vote of two thirds of the members present. So the question is, what is meant by two thirds of the members present? You have five. You have five people present. Um, only three voted yes. So that's uh, sixty percent. That's less than two thirds. Now Steve pointed out that under New Hampshire law. Um, at least under New Hampshire corporate law, uh, on a board of directors, someone who abstains from voting is deemed to have voted with the majority. So uh, as far as we know, this issue has never gone to court in this, in this specific circumstance. But if it did, a judge might rule, well, the person who abstained is deemed to have voted yes. Uh, but we think the answer is clear. And I think our message is you shouldn't be abstaining in the first place. If, uh, if you're there, if you participated in the non-public session, um, you should, uh, and there's a motion to seal the minutes, you vote yes or you vote no. You're, and, and this is one of, the, one of my pet peeves about, um, about board voting generally. There are too many people abstaining um, on, on municipal boards. There's, there's almost never a good reason to abstain from voting. If you're recused, if you have to recuse yourself because of a conflict of interest or some other reason, that's a different matter. But if you're there for the discussion and you're participating in the discussion and the decision, you should, you should not abstain. So I, I hope that this circumstance will never arise because everyone who's present will actually be voting one way or, or the other on the motion. Although I will point out that there was a somewhat related question that was addressed by the New Hampshire Supreme Court in a case entitled McCray versus, I believe it's the Merrimack Board of Selectmen, where a, a, a council member, uh, Mr. McCray, attempted to abstain so that the, um, because of the way that there were other recusals on, amongst that public body, his abstention was intended, from his point of view, to rob that particular council, it was the Board of Selectmen, I believe, uh, from having a majority so that they could have, excuse me, from having a quorum. And I know the Supreme Court did address the issue. You can't abstain in such a fashion so that it, it, the intent is to rob the group from having a quorum. Uh, that's not permissible. But that's a slightly different issue than uh, abstaining and then uh, drawing into question whether or not a majority vote occurred. Um, before we go on, we, we have a couple of uh, we have a few questions that have come in. Um, one of the one of the questions is: uh, Is it permissible to just quote the specific RSA RSA you will be following? 
Um, I think the question is, can, can you just quote the language of the paragraph in 91A3, or do you have to actually say 91A3, paragraph 2, subparagraph A? Um, and I, my opinion is, if you, if you just quote it, that's probably okay, as long as it's very clear which, uh, which provision of 91A3 you're using. Either, either cite either cite it using the number or do it by quoting it. One or the other should be sufficient. We have a couple other questions um, that we'll, maybe we'll handle at the end uh, if we have time, and I think we probably will. So next, uh, uh, going on on the other uh, reasons that can be employed under the statute to go in the non-public session is uh, consideration of the acquisition, sale, or lease of real or personal property, 91A3 Roman 2D. Uh, I mean, this is a fairly easy one to understand. The town or city are considering purchasing a piece of property, and uh, there's been a dis discussion has to take place amongst the Board of Selectmen as to how much they are intending to offer, but also how much would be the maximum amount they would prepare to offer. And certainly, if the Selectmen are prepared to pay up to $110,000, but they're going to make a first offer of $90,000, you don't want the seller to know that the, the selectman might go up another $20,000, you want to be able to hold that information back. And that would be a legitimate basis to go into non-public session to have a discussion of that type, because it would potentially benefit the seller whose interests are adverse to the general community. And then uh, 91A3, Roman 2E, consideration, negotiation of pending claims or litigation. Um, so if the town has been sued, whether it's a ZBA complaint, whether it's a personal injury complaint, whether it's uh, an employee complaint that is brought, a claim has been brought against the town, uh, that may be discussed in non-public session, but the claim has to be in writing or filed against the public body. So in, in my opinion, that could be a demand letter. Um, so if a letter has been sent to the, the selectman saying, I hereby demand that you reinstate employee so-and-so, and if you don't, I'm going to bring a claim against the town before the Human Rights Commission or some other legal body, that's a claim in writing. Uh, certainly any claim filed against the town, whether it's an administrative claim, wage and hours, unemployment, uh, you could have a claim in Superior Court, you could have it in Circuit Court, those would all be claims that are pending. Uh, but also note that any application filed for a tax abatement, which I believe Cordell mentioned before, uh, shall not constitute a filed litigation against any public body except having to do with inability to pay or poverty. So tax abatements are not threatened litigation that are a basis to go in a non-public section. And uh, just uh, jump in here. Um, I admit that I was, uh, I was looking at the question, so I wasn't paying attention fully to what Steve was just saying, so I, I don't know whether he covered this point. Um, but uh, notice that the language says litigation uh, uh, against the public body. So it does not cover litigation filed by the public body against someone else. So if the town has sued someone else, technically under this provision, uh, this does not allow you to go into non-public session to, to discuss that litigation. I think that's an oversight in the statute. We've tried to get it corrected to say uh, uh, litigation by or against the public body, but we haven't been successful in, in getting that clarification yet. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Cordell. Um, the next one I want to point out is emergency functions, 91A3, Roman 2, uh, paragraph, small letter I. Uh, I, I don't know that this is often going to be found to be employed by towns. And the only one example I could come up with that would be fit into this consideration of matters relating to carrying out emergency functions and training for such functions intended to toward a deliberate act uh, that would create widespread injury or loss of life. The only one I can really think of as an example is if, and I know there are a number of these regional SWAT team um, organizations in New Hampshire, you could have a number of towns having intermunicipal agreement to have a SWAT team organized amongst four or five police departments. 
And I think the content of that agreement, especially if it was related to dealing with responses to terrorist attacks, um, and you wanted to discuss that agreement, in, uh, you could do so in non-public session because it would fit into this um, emergency function exception. Uh, next, let's talk about the minutes of non-public sessions and sealing the minutes. Um, first and foremost, minutes of non-public sessions have to be kept, and they are presumptively, and I think this is an important thing to keep in mind, um, anytime you have a non-public session, your minutes are, are automatically deemed to be available to the public for inspection. So that's the starting off point. When you keep minutes in non-public session, the public has a right to them, except and that's the exception that we'll discuss now, which is um, there is a vote um, of two-thirds of the members present that it was determined by those two-thirds majority uh, that the divulgence of the information would adversely affect the reputation of a person or render the proposed action ineffective or pertain to terrorism. So you've just voted. Um, uh, in a non-public session um, under uh, the discipline of a public employee to fire someone, um, you could evoke uh, and the content of the reasons why the person was being fired would hurt their reputation. Uh, you could go into not, you could decide by a two-thirds majority not to release those non-public meeting minutes. Um, the uh, other thing I think that um, you should keep in mind when you're making that decision is how do you make the vote. Now this section of the right to know law doesn't require a roll call vote. Um, I don't think it's imprudent. I would think it would be a good idea when you have this vote to seal the non-public meeting minutes that it would be done by a roll call vote. Uh, and I think that should be done uh, at at the exit of the meeting. You would exit non-public uh, meeting and then you would immediately vote to seal the minutes. You know, we get the question frequently, uh, if we're going to vote to see, or the vote on whether to seal the minutes, should that, should that occur during the non-public session or after we uh, exit non-public session? Um, I used to say that I would do it during non-public session because, the, because you might need to discuss the reasons for doing it. Uh, but over time I've changed my opinion and I think it probably is better to do it after you exit and do it in public. The law doesn't, doesn't say there's no requirement, so legally you can do it either in non-public or in public session. But I think um, on balance it's probably better to, to do that vote once you come back into public session um, so at least the public will know what you're doing and they'll, they'll know that you have voted to seal the minutes and they'll know that you've done it properly. And then the statute goes on to make clear that um, then you made that vote to seal the non-public meeting minutes um, and they will remain sealed until in the opinion of the majority of the members the conditions that led you to seal them no longer apply. Um, and I think that raises an issue which comes up frequently. Uh, what duty does a public body have to review past non-public meeting minutes and decide that the circumstances for sealing those minutes or that particular set of minutes no longer apply and will unseal them. Um, I think there's probably a need um, as a matter of administration of a, a public body to do some kind of regular, and this could be yearly, uh, I, I'm, there's nothing in particular in the statute that addresses this, that you know there would be some attempt to actively go back and look at your non-public meeting minutes and decide whether the circumstances uh, justifying their sealing no longer apply and unseal them. Uh, I know that uh, we also discussed yesterday or the day before, you know, what right does a new member of the Board of Selectmen, someone who's just come onto the board, uh, have to look at non-public meeting minutes that that member uh, did not participate in? And uh, I certainly have the opinion, I think this was once shared by Cordell, that any member of a public body uh, a Board of Selectmen, as an example, would have a right to look at any non-public meeting minutes, uh, even, that, even though that person is new to the board, 
and didn't participate in those particular non-public meetings. Agreed. Um, finally, we want to just, just cover as a reminder not to be school marmish, but necessi it's necessary to remind everyone of what are the consequences for um, uh, violating the right to no law. And the first of these consequences is what happens if a public official uh, violates the confidentiality of a non-public session. And there is a statute um, that directly addresses this. And I don't have it cited here, but it's RSA 42 colon 1 dash A, I believe. Correct, 42 1 A. Yeah. Um, that basically says that a public one of the things a public officer does is they take an off of office. So this statute 42 colon 1 dash A says it's considered a violation of your oath of office if you um, divulge information received in a non-public session. Uh, and that would adversely affect the reputation of a person or render municipal action ineffective, or, and this is un coming under another section of the statute, you uh, release information or disclose information that you received in the course of your uh, job as a public official, uh, which was not subject to disclosure under RSA 91 colon A dash A colon 5. So these create standards in the, in the Oath of Office statute that can be employed by others to take action to have that public official removed from office. And as indicated in the next slide, the manner of bringing a petition to dismiss a public official would be through petition to the Superior Court. So again, one of the consequences of breaching the right to know law that is failing to keep confidential information confidential received in a non-public session could be someone seeking to petition to have uh, a public official removed from office. And finally, there we'll talk about the remedies for and against the municipality for violation of 91A. Um, if a public body um, commits a purposeful violation of the statute, court finding such that the public body knew or should have known the conduct was a violation of the right to no law, the court may award attorney's fees. Um, and uh, the court may invalidate the action by the public body held in violation of the right to know law. However, the court may also award attorney fees to the public body, that is, this is a proactive benefit to uh, public bodies, if the lawsuit against the public body under the right to know law was filed in bad faith, was considered frivolous, unjust, vexatious, wanton, or oppressive. So there's a balancing here in the statute it's designed to penalize municipalities if they violate the right to know law knowingly, um, but also it's, it's a cautionary note to those who would bring claims against the town of the right to know law. If those claims are deemed to be in bad faith or frivolous, those persons also can be assessed attorney's fees for the benefit of the public agency. Um, one of the other things that are important to keep in uh, mind um, that the statute does provide for circumstances where the court can personally say that a particular public official personally acted in bad faith and that public official can be ordered to personally pay for fines um, under the statute. And I believe uh, there's actually a, an assessment number in the statute. Um, I think it's uh, between two hundred fifty and two thousand um, dollars is a fine that could be assessed. Right. So the statute says not less than two hundred fifty dollars, and not more than two thousand dollars. So again, it's a reminder: public officials can have um, uh, personally have assessed against them personal assessments uh, for violation of the right to no law, and then finally, the the court can also uh, enjoin future violations. And the, so the court can say, you shall conduct your public, uh, your right to know, your, uh, your, your meetings in, the, in this fashion in the future. And the court can also say, and attend the next public uh, right to know law webinar from the New Hampshire Municipal Association or for some other uh, educational uh, uh, information for the public official. Yeah, that, that is probably the most severe penalty uh, that a court could uh, impose on someone is having to attend uh, a presentation by, by us about the right to know law. So, so that should uh, be a good warning not to violate the law. Um, we do. 
Okay, so that brings us to the end of the but we But we do have several questions that maybe we could discuss here. Um, I have a question here. Uh, it says, what about an appointment of a current employee to an officer in charge position for a period of three months and rate of pay? So I, I'm not exactly sure uh, what what the person is referring to by officer in charge, but it, it sounds like the town has a, someone who is currently an employee and, and there's a proposal to appoint that someone to uh, an additional position um, and to discuss the rate of pay that that sounds to me like you're discussing the hiring of, or possibly promotion of a public employee and rate of pay that's compensation of a public employee so certainly um, promotion and compensation are uh, appropriate grounds for non-public session under 91A3 paragraph 2A and hiring uh, is is under 2B. So that to me sounds like that would be appropriate uh, if, if you, but you need to make sure that, that you can classify it on, as as either promotion or compensation or hiring of the person as a public employee. Does that sound right to you? I, it sounds exactly right. Um, then uh, kind of similar question I think, should the board go into non-public session to discuss a recommendation of a supervisor to fill a vacancy of a full-time position from a part-time position? Well, that would certainly uh, so, okay, be so a promotion. The, yeah, the, so the supervisor is recommending that someone go from a part-time to a full-time position. And I, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that that would be a promotion. Right, that and, sounds like a promotion. And that would be a proper subject of, an, of, of a 91A uh, Roman 2A, 2A uh, yeah. uh, non-public session. Right. Then the next question is, how can we properly discuss employee performance if you can't use general, quote, personnel as a basis for non-public session? And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult question. I mean, the, the statute doesn't talk about performance per se. Um, if you're talking about a specific employee's performance, uh, then you you may well be talking about uh, compensation of that person. If you're doing, for example, an annual review and you're talking about compensation, that would be appropriate for non-public session. Or it could be characterized as a form of discipline because certainly um, performance evaluations can sometimes result in disciplinary outcomes. I mean, I know that there are performance evaluations that are graded and that grading system can result in either being permitted to move to the next step in your wage scale, which would be a promotion issue, or, uh, you know, not receiving as many benefits as one would like under the system that's allocating benefits to the employee, which would be a form of discipline. So it, it's is perhaps an area that requires some degree of uh, consideration of an amendment to the statute, but it's going to have to either fall in some fashion under promotion or discipline uh, and be characterized as such. Yeah, and I, I don't know that, uh, that a, a board as a whole, or well, that a board period, would typically be discussing a specific individual employee if it didn't have to do with promotion, hiring, compensation, or discipline. Um, if it's just an annual performance review of, say, uh, uh, a member of the highway department, presumably that review would be done by the road agent or ultimately by the town, town manager or town administrator. So I, I I don't know I don't know how often that would come up. I think ordinarily, if you're talking about a specific employee, it would, it would be within one of those exceptions. Uh, we're we're getting a whole lot of questions at the end, and I don't think we're going to have time to answer all of them here. But we can. I think we are able to send answers to the people who have asked them. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Can you direct me to the place that states that we cannot use 91A32C to go into non-public to appoint citizens to fill places on committees and alternate board positions, et cetera? Um, so that's the, that's the reputation standard. Uh, I don't think there's any, anything that, that specifically says you can't use that as a basis for it, but the question is, um, it, is the discussion something that, that could adversely affect the person's reputation? And you know, I, I used the example before, if we're just talking about we have a couple of applicants for a position, and I like one and someone else likes another one, it, we're just talking about our opinions about that person as opposed to specific claims that you know, the person is uh, a child molester or, or tortures his dog or something like that. If there are specific allegations that the person um, that would seriously, or that, that would legitimately adversely affect that per person's reputation, then I think, yes, you can go into non-public session to discuss that appointment. But you can't, the, the statute doesn't allow you to go into non-public session to discuss an appointment of a public official just because you're talking about a public official. Um, so if you're, if you're in that position, I think you need to wait and see whether there, whether there could be something that is an actual allegation that would adversely affect that person's reputation. Um, can we do one more question? Um, uh, let's see. If, uh, if the term personnel is used for A, how would the person entitled to a meeting realize they are the topic of discussion in non-public? Well, I, I think that um, the way you would address that is you first have to decide, do your local rules provide for that person's right to a meeting. Right. If, if, if you know, again, the, the example I gave before, let's assume your personal rules say that um, the disciplinary process starts with the supervisor saying, I'm hereby disciplining you and I'm going to put you on leave without pay for a week. And let's assume your personnel rules go on to say that if the supervisor issues that kind of discipline, uh, and the employee can appeal the discipline of that type to the Board of Selectmen. Assume that's what your personnel rules say, then I think um, you would have an affirmative obligation to tell the employee, uh, once they've appealed to the Board of Selectmen, that you know they have a right to a meeting and we're going to have the hearing on this on a certain date so that they're made aware that's when it's going to take place and that's when they can exercise this right to either have this uh, meeting with the Board of Selectmen or hearing on the subject in public or non-public. Okay. Um, we, we have several more questions. It, it's past one o'clock, but we'll, uh, I think we'll take a couple min more minutes to try to answer these. We've got a, a flurry of them after 12.55, and a couple of them are pretty easily answered. Um, do staff meetings qualify for non-public session? And the short answer to that is that staff meetings are not considered meetings that are subject to the right to know law. So if you have, uh, you know, if you have a regular Monday meeting of the um, of the police department staff, that's not because there's not a public body there. That's not a meeting that's subject to the right to know law. Or if you have a regular meeting of the town hall employees or whatever, again, there's not a public body that is subject to the right to know law. So the question doesn't come up with staff meetings. Um, and then there's a question, can some members of a board meet for a non-public meeting and request another board member not attend due to conflict of interest? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the I guess if if you have a majority of the board, 
getting together to discuss uh, something under that's within their jurisdiction, that's a meeting. It's subject to the right to know law. Um, can they request that another board member not attend? I suppose they can ask, but the, the person, you, you can't stop the other board member from attending. Um, the if the board member and this this is whether it's public or non-public the bo board member has a right to attend the meeting uh, if there's some action that's going to be taken and that person has a conflict of interest well that person should recuse himself or herself from discussion from the discussion and the action taken but still has a right to attend the meeting um, if there's if you're going to go into non-public session uh well i guess that maybe that's the ultimate question here is our, we have our board is meeting and we're now going to go into non-public session assuming we have a legitimate reason to go into non-public session can we exclude one of our own board members from that non -public yeah i mean assume session? former cornell that board member you yeah. got a board member a five member board of selectmen one of the selectmen has sued the town, mm -hmm. and they want to go into non-public session to discuss this pending claim. Right. Um, you know, I, I think it would be pretty reasonable for them to say, no, you can't join this meeting right. because we're about to discuss legal issues involving your claim against the town. Right. Um, now, the other thing to keep in mind is that if the town has an ethics code, you might have an ethics code that stipulates a public official has to recuse himself in certain circumstances. And that's another place to turn to supplement how you arrive at such a decision. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good, and I don't know whether that's the scenario that the questioner has in mind, but that's that's a good example. It would seems to me it would be a very rare case. But it, yeah, it, it would be a situation where a member of the board has either sued the town or maybe there's some kind of proposed contract um, so there is a clear conflict of interest, and that person should be uh, not participating in the discussion. And, and if you have a legitimate reason for non-public session, then yes, I think you could exclude that person. Um, so we have, we have several other questions. We're not going to have time to answer, uh, and I'm not actually not sure with the technology whether we are able to email answers to these questions. But uh, I think we can, and if we can't. Um, as always, feel free to call um, our uh, call our office with uh, your legal inquiries about these questions. Um, very good. Well, uh, thank you, Cordell. Thank you, Steve. A very informative uh, uh, webinar, as always. And uh, thank you, our members, for participating as well. Uh, shortly, you will receive a link to a four-question uh, survey, and we ask that you take the time uh, to respond to it so we uh, can share your feedback with our presenters. Also, please look in your email in the next couple days, a recording of this webinar, uh, probably sent from me, Tim Fortier. Um, and again, uh, we thank you for participating in today's webinar.